strength. Psalm 28, verse 7 says this, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song will I praise him. Please stand and join us as we sing praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer.
singing. I, the nice thing about the two services, I get to sing the songs twice. So I think I said that last week, but it's a good time. Glad to see everybody here. Uh, we'll have a word of prayer. I'd appreciate you praying for uh, my parents as they travel uh, to Florida. They're visiting with my grandmother, um, who's very ill, and um, so be praying for 
uh, my dad's mom, and then they're going to also be visiting with my sister Lydia up in Pensacola. So pray for them as they travel this week and um, different needs of the church as well. We'll pray for our country and for our president this morning. Um, but it's important to gather as God's people, amen? amen. And uh, let's look to the Lord, ask him to bless this assembly today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come and worship together. I thank you for uh, all that gathered earlier this morning and all who are gathering now in this service, as well as those who are on the live stream now. I pray that uh, you'd meet with us each wherever we are, that we would be uh, fully engaged in worship this morning. Lord, you are worthy. Um, we pray for the needs of our church. We pray that you'd continue to uh, be with the Mimits family and, the, and the, the loss of Wendy's mom. Be with that family. Comfort them. I, I pray also for Brittany and the loss of her grandmother and, and what her family's going through. And then, Lord, I, I do pray for um, those who are ill this morning, those who are sick. I pray for uh, my parents as they travel, that you give them a good uh, traveling mercies and a good visit uh, with my grandmother. I pray also for, um, again, for those that are struggling with illness and sickness now. We pray especially uh, for our president and his wife. We pray that your hand of healing would be upon him. We pray that you'd bring him through this, that you'd guide our country in these difficult days. And Lord, we're just thankful that you are in control, that there's nothing that happens outside of your sovereign hand. And Lord, you knew everything that we would face this year. And um, we just want to be faithful to you in the midst of it. So help us to, help us to be your faithful people. And Lord, I pray now for the, uh, the rest of the singing today. We pray that it would lift up and magnify your name. We pray also for the, um, the taking of the offering. We pray for the preaching of your word, that everything we do uh, would magnify and exalt the name of Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. All right, it is good to see everybody today, and you should have a bulletin somewhere near you in a hymnal rack so that you can see some of the things that are uh, taking place going on. Um, one of those things is that um, we have our missions conference coming up. So we've got three uh, missionary guests that are going to be with us. One will be in person, and that is Max and Debbie Harmon. They've got a great uh, testimony. They've been in missions, I, I want to say for over 30 years, we supported them for a long time. They actually came back, uh, probably 10 years ago, they came back from the field of Peru to minister to one or both of their ailing parents. Um, and then after that time was over, they actually returned. They got back on the field. They went back to Peru. Um, and so we're pretty excited to hear from them again. So they'll be with us in person. They've been traveling around New England. Um, and then we have two guest missionaries that are going to join us virtually. So the Mortensen family, be praying for the Mortensons. They're missionaries to Honduras. They came here probably four or five years ago, and we, didn't, we were not able to take them on for support. We'd like to try to take them on this year. Um, and so pray for them. They had uh, plans. They had come back to the States for a furlough, and then the COVID pandemic happened. It messed up all their travel plans, like all of our missionaries. And so they finally got approval, and they got their tickets to fly back to Honduras, and they had to get the negative COVID test. That was a requirement. And they're all feeling fine. Everybody's doing well. They have their plane tickets. They had to go the night before, the day before to get their test results. And Nate tested positive for COVID. No symptoms, as far as I know, perfectly healthy. Um, but he got the, either it's, he's asymptomatic or there's a false positive or whatever. They couldn't travel because of the tickets. So uh, they've purchased new tickets, I believe, and they're rearranging their travel plans. So by the time we have missions conference. They may or may not be back in Honduras. Either way, they're going to remote in on Friday night and talk with us about what the Lord's doing there. So set those dates aside for our missions conference. As will be Friday night. Then Saturday night, our missionaries to Taiwan, the Greens, we've supported them for a long time. And they're going to come and, uh, in, on video. And uh, they're at another missions conference in Ohio, but they're going to share with us on our Saturday night of that missions conference. And then, of course, we'll have our Sunday service. On that Sunday, we're only going to have one combined service. So uh, we've made a lot of room in here in both services, plenty of room for guests to come on that combined service. If we have a really full house, just be ready. We might have to use the overflow room or something. We'll keep everything safe and socially distanced and all, and all of those things, but we'll have one combined service um, that week during missions conference. So that is coming up. Um, and then also you see in there the men's conference is just two weeks away. If you'd like to go to that, let me know. We want to get you signed up on the Victory Baptist website. So 
all good things happening, and um, we are uh, looking forward to the coming weeks as we, as we move ahead. I want to encourage you to invite someone. If you were downstairs right now, you'd see a wonderful group of kids all spread out. Uh, and we've had great kids programs going on during our 1030 service. So if you're watching, I want to invite you to come with your family, be a part of it. There's plenty of room for you, lots of safety measures in place. Um, either at our 9 o'clock or our 1030 service. We'd love to have you come in person. All right, well, what we're going to do now is we're going to ask God's blessing on the offering today. We don't receive the offering, but it is in the, in the hallway on the way in, and we do want to pray to dedicate that. Aaron, I'm going to ask if you would uh, say the blessing over the offering today. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that, we've had, that we have to come together. Lord, we do thank you for all the many gifts that you've blessed us with. We thank you for... Um, Lord, this church, this building, and Lord, we do pray that this morning, now as we give back to you uh, just a small portion of what you've given us and blessed us with, that Lord, you would bless it, that we would use the money to uh, bring honor and glory to you to further the gospel ministry here in North Adams and across the world. Bless the rest of our day and our service today in Jesus' name, amen. I stand with us one more time as we sing, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. said that they nailed that ending the first two times they did it. So anyway, good to see you again. Take your Bibles this morning and let's turn to 1 Corinthians. We are in our third message in this series, Saved, uh, the difference that Jesus makes. And I am glad, I'm thankful for the day that I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior and I was saved by His grace. It's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing to know 
that you know that you're saved, that you're a child of God, that your sins are forgiven. And so one of the themes that we've discussed is that if you're a Christian, you don't have to be a believer very long, and you don't have to, even if you're an unbeliever, you don't have to hang around Christians very long to hear them talk a lot about being saved. And a lot of people at first, are, they hear that, and they're probably like, what in the world are they talking about? Saved? What, what do you mean by that? Um, and so in the series, that's exactly what we're examining. Obviously, being saved means I've entered into a saving relationship with Christ, that he's my Lord and Savior. He's forgiven me of all my past sins and all my future sins, and he's given me a home in heaven so that I can know that when I die, I'm saved from my sins, I'm saved from hell, and I'll be with the Lord. But there's more to being saved than just delivered from hell. You see that the Bible says that we are not just saved uh, from our past and saved for the future, but we are being saved here and now. That God is doing a saving work in our lives each and every day. And that's really the theme of the book of uh, 1 Corinthians. These are not perfect people. They've got a lot of problems in this city of Corinth that this book was written to. A lot of problems, but God is not done with them. And God is not done with us. If we're here, no matter uh, the situation we're in, God is not finished. He wants to do a work in our lives. So our theme verse is verse number 18. So look at 1 Corinthians 1. And I'd like us to read out loud together verse number 18. And hopefully at the end of all the weeks of this study, you'll just have this verse memorized. We'll have said it so much. So 1 Corinthians 1. Verse number 18, let's read it out loud together. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. It's all about Christ, the message of the cross, the message that saved us once and for all from the penalty of our sin. Today it saves us from the power of sin. And now I want us to focus on our special emphasis today. It's going to be in the following verses. And it's going to be this. The title of the message today is Saved, Renewed Thinking. So if you're taking notes this morning, I'd encourage you, we're going to talk about thinking. So I'd encourage you to be thinking and fully engaged and following along as we go. So renewed thinking. And I think as I read the next couple of verses, you'll see some thinking words. Let's read verse number 19. I'll read it. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of of the wise. Do you see our first thinking words there in this passage? The wisdom of the wise. And will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. More thinking words. Verse 20 now. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Let's pray together. Dear Lord, I ask that you'd help us today, help me as I preach. I need the, uh, the clarity and the, the power of the Holy Spirit to speak only uh, to explain the Word of God, not give my own ideas or opinions, but only uh, what you have for us from this passage. And I pray for us as a church, as we each listen, I pray that our hearts and our minds would be fully attentive because you are worthy of our attention. And the words of Scripture are words of life. They can change us. And renew us. So we pray, Lord, today for the renewing of our minds. We pray that, uh, that your will and your work would be accomplished. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we're talking about renewed thinking. A fresh way of uh, thinking about things. Now, when we talk about wisdom, and that was really the word you saw a lot in there. If you circled it, you'd see wisdom or wise a few times. When we get to chapter 2, we're going to see Paul talk even more about this. But he introduces it here in chapter 1. Now, it's important that we have the same definition of the words that we talk about. So we talk about wisdom. We're not just talking about accumulated knowledge or facts. Um, my son, who I picked on a little bit last week, and I'm not going to this week, but he has got a lot of facts accumulated in his 11, almost 12-year-old mind. I mean, a lot of facts. He can tell you baseball stats, world stats, geography stats. He, you know, I don't know if he's training for a future Jeopardy appearance or what, but he's got the stats and the facts down. And that's pretty cool to be able to remember that and recall all that. that. That's really neat. But that's not wisdom, right? Wisdom is as a person grows and matures, they're able to take what they know and apply it to the situations of their lives. And that's important for young people to not just to learn knowledge, but to have wisdom, and but for all of us as well. The Bible has a lot to say about wisdom. And so when we talk about wisdom, really, it's, we're talking about like worldview, right? The way we understand the world that we live in, 
the view we have of the universe, uh, the beliefs that we have about life. That's what God's talking about here. That's what the Holy Spirit is showing us through Paul, that, that there's a way that the world thinks and that there's a way that the believer ought to think about things. And they're different. They're different. And so we're going to discuss this topic today of renewed thinking. You know, the, the way we think affects our actions, doesn't it? What you think about something is going to affect how you act. We're coming to an election. What you, the way you think about things is going to affect how you vote, even. Thinking affects all of our lives. And Christian people are supposed to be a thinking people. Do you believe that? That Christian people, above all, ought to be a thinking people. Now, there are some groups or individuals in Christianity that really diminish thinking or intellectualism or, or careful study. And that's a shame because the Bible never does that. And they'll look at a passage like this and they'll say, see that, all that wisdom of the world, we don't need none of that. And it's just, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about serious thought about the world, about the universe, in light of what God's word has to say. But at the same time, not the same kind of thinking as the rest of the world around us. But how you think affects your actions. Can anybody think of some what was I thinking moments in their life? I mean, like what in the world was I thinking? I remember a few years ago when we lived in Bennington, we had our, our house there. And uh, Dennis Richards, he's not here today, but he's helped me with a lot of different projects on my house. There have been a couple what were we thinking moments over the course of my uh, construction career in, in my own home. But I'll never forget one time that was a very clear <laughs> what, what was I thinking? We, um, we were doing some plumbing. Now, whenever I get my plumbing stuff out, Deborah goes into a complete panic, and for good reason. But we were doing some plumbing, and um, we were redoing a bathroom in the upstairs of the house. I'm redoing this plumbing. And so we shut all the water off, and we got all the lines hooked up, and we had a lot of problems and obstacles we had to overcome, and we finally figured it out. We got everything connected just how we wanted it, and so, you know, everything was ready to be tested. The toilet wasn't connected yet, but I had all the connections there already, and then I went down, and uh, Dennis stayed upstairs, and I went downstairs to where my main water was, and I grabbed a hold of that valve, and I just cranked that thing open and let all that water pressure fly. And we had never closed the toilet valves. And so all of a sudden, I hear Dennis just yelling upstairs. He's drenched with water. Shut it off! Shut it off! So I run in there. I shut the thing off, only to walk out. Now, if you were ever in that house, you know my ceiling was a wainscoting ceiling. And we just watched the rain come through the ceiling into the living room. That was definitely a... What in the world was I thinking? And some of you are probably like, what were you thinking that you could do plumbing in the first place, right? What was I thinking? How we think affects our actions. And you know, honestly, the right kind of thinking results in the right kind of actions. But obviously, the wrong kind of thinking results in the wrong actions in our lives. And if you can look at, if you were to look at the course of a person's life, and a lot of times, not always, but often people find themselves in difficult situations or a culture or a country can actually find itself in a difficult situation. And if you were to trace that back, often you'd find that the fruit of some wrong-headed thinking, some, some unbiblical thinking. In the world of counseling, as people try to help others solve their problems and, and deal with deep-seated emotional issues, often people are trapped in unhealthy and wrong thinking patterns. And they make choices for their relationships, or they make choices that, uh, in their family. And they make all these decisions that eventually harm them, but it's because they're trapped in wrong thinking patterns. Well, the Bible has a lot to say about renewed thinking versus the natural thinking that we're born with. And part of being a follower of Jesus is allowing him to renew my thinking day by day. In fact, I want to give you the scripture the scripture uh, passage is Romans chapter 12 and verse number 2. Romans 12 and verse 2, the Bible says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, this topic of the renewing of the mind is really what's being dealt with in 1 Corinthians both here in chapter 1 and also we're going to see it in chapter 2. But he introduces it here. And so this morning, I'd like all of us, just for the next moments that we have, all of us to be willing to have our 
thinking challenged. Can you agree to that this morning? Are you willing to allow your thinking to be challenged today? Okay, a couple of us are going to be, we're, going to, we're coming up for it. We're ready. If you're watching this, whether you're a Christian or you're not Christian, I'd encourage you, allow, your, allow the, the scriptures and what we're going to speak about today to challenge your thinking. We're going to look at verses 19 and 20, and we're going, I'm going to give you these three points today. For those of you that like to jot notes down, in verses 19 and 20, we're going to be challenged to think critically, to think critically. Then in verses 21 down through verse number 24, we're going to be challenged to think faithfully. Think critically, then think faithfully. And finally, in the final verses, we're going to be challenged to think spiritually. Think spiritually. So think critically, think faithfully, and think spiritually. That's, the, that's what we'll look at. So let's first look at this idea of thinking critically. Join me in verse 19 and verse 20. Let's read. We've already read them, but let's look at them a little more carefully. For it is written, it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Boy, the Lord is actually being critical of some thinking patterns here. The Lord says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. I'll bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath, God, hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? The challenge here is really to the unbelievers, unbelievers in Jesus, that they need to think critically. That those who are so self-assured of their opinions, so self-assured of their viewpoints, the, the Bible and the, the Holy Spirit says there's some criticism to be applied. But I want to encourage us as Christians, I, I feel that we live in a generation that is lacking critical thought processes. We live in a day and age where people are not being trained uh, both, by the way, both inside and outside the church, I feel that we have an epidemic of serious lack in critical thinking. That we carry a series of assumptions or we carry a beliefs that are just handed to us and we follow them blindly. Now, many Christians are accused of that, aren't we? Have you ever been accused, somebody saying that you're just blindly following uh, some teachings that have been given to you? And you know what? Sadly, there are some Christians who just blindly follow traditions or teachings that have been handed to them. But then there are also some people that are scientists or philosophers or academics or even just the general population at large who simply follow things that have been handed to them. But we have to think critically. Let me ask two questions here. Think about this. Ready? What affects your thought processes? What affects the way you think? Some experiences you've had? Influences on your life, education, family, just the going with the flow of society, so to speak. These are all things that affect our thinking. I would call these influences. There are influences that affect us. But then the second question is this. Honestly, ask yourself this question. Do you, do you allow your thinking to be challenged? And I'm asking that for Christians who are in the room and watching on video. But I'm also asking that question to unbelievers, and you should ask that question of your friends who are not believers in Christ. Do you allow your thinking to be challenged? And Christians, do you allow your thoughts to be challenged? You see, in this passage, what he's, he's trying to show the church, one of the things I should say that, that the church learns from this, is not to be a lazy thinker. You see, a lazy thinker is easily influenced. You see, there's wisdom of the wise. There's understanding of the prudent, the wise, the scribe, the disputer of this world. I'm reminded of this scripture, Ephesians 4 and verse number 14. Ephesians 4 and verse number 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of, what's the word? Doctrine. Now, that word doctrine means teaching. And the picture in this passage is this. It's somebody who's just easily influenced. Easily influenced. What happens? They hear somebody uh, in church say this. Oh, that's interesting. I think I'll come over here. Then they hear somebody on the television say this. Oh, I think I'll believe that for a little while. Or they read an article. And then they are shifting to this position, to that position. The scriptures tell us this. Listen. Listen. We need to be careful that we are not lazy thinkers, 
that have just become easily influenced. There's not just lazy thinkers, but in this passage, I want you to see this. There's also arrogant thinkers. Arrogant thinkers. Now, you've got to understand the audience. Look at verse, um, look at verse number 19. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise in verse 19. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Well, who says these people are wise? They do. And all of their friends do. And all of the, the people that are like them say, oh, you are very wise. It's kind of like business associations that uh, create imaginary, um, imaginative rewards and recognitions that they can give to each other. You know, best of the year, most winning. Well, who says that? Well, we do. It's the same in, in our culture, though, that we like to confer degrees on one another and we like to set up different people as experts and, uh, and, and officials, the great, uh, the, the great um, speakers and TED Talk givers of our generations. And many of them have great intelligence and they're very smart. But God gives us a little perspective here. And he, and he puts in perspective all the wisdom of humanity combined compared, compared to the wisdom of our great and perfect and all-powerful creator. It sure doesn't add up to much, does it? Ours. But yet, there are arrogant thinkers. You see, in this audience, who is he speaking to? Remember, these are Christians in the city of Corinth. And really, in this church, these young believers in Corinth, there's really two groups of people. There were Jewish people. And these Jewish people had grown up with scribes teaching them the, their ancient scriptures. They had a way of thinking. And then on the other hand, there were these uh, Gentile Greeks and Romans who are a part. And, and they weren't influenced by that group over there. But they had this idea of, um, of Greek wisdom and knowledge and philosophy and the pagan worship around them. Either way, you've got both of these people brought together in the church of God. And God says, listen, you need to stop making a big deal about human arrogant wisdom and humble yourself a little bit. You see, the self-appointed experts will disappoint you. So there's this, this arrogant thinking of the experts or of the, the elite class, so to speak. But then I want us to be careful of something else. There's another arrogant kind of thinking that may not be of the intellectual of the, or the elite, but there is an arrogant thinking that says, I don't need all your fancy talk and letters. All I need is some good old-fashioned old -fashioned common sense. Some good old-fashioned common sense. Well, it dawned upon me once, somebody, uh, somebody brought this to my attention one time, that common sense is only common sense to the people who believe that it's common sense. <laughs> right? There's also an arrogance in just saying, well, I don't need any of that, your information, because when you put all that trust in common sense, who are you setting up as the expert? Me. Myself. My ideas. You see, common sense is also another arrogant statement. You gotta, if you think just like me, then that's the way to be. So the truth is this. If something is true, if something is right, I must believe it. Do you agree with me on that? If it's true, if it's right, I must believe it. But some people have that flipped around and they say, well, if I believe it, it must be right. If I believe it, it must be right. Come on, honestly, how many of you have fallen into those kind of thinking patterns before? I mean, honestly, if I believe it, if it's what I accept, then it must be right. Well, really, all of our views, and on the one hand, if you remember this church in Corinth, on the one hand, they have a very traditional culture, very traditional culture, very conservative culture, all the scribes bringing down their interpretations of the Old Testament law and handing them down. There were lots of good things that they probably received, but they had. But was that culture 100% Bible and truth? No. And on the other hand, you had the Gentile philosophies. It was a much more uh, libertine and permissive kind of a culture, and theirs wasn't right either. But each of them had to come and submit their common sense to the Scriptures. You see, one person. We see this today in the breakdown of our culture, the breakdown of our politics. What has happened? What has happened? We don't think the same way. On this side, somebody says, well, this is just common sense. And on this side, that person says, you're a radical. And then they say this, this is common sense. 
And this side says, you're a radical, right? Because we don't think the same way. Now, for Christians especially, it is especially important for you and I to be critical thinkers. Not, we're not critics, but we're critical thinkers. To take all of our thoughts and to say, well, why do I accept this belief? To bring them to the Word of God, to allow the Spirit of God to, to teach us. And I would say in a culture like we have, in a Christian culture, quote unquote, I know it's, it's different now, but in a Christian culture, it can be hard for us to sometimes differentiate the things I believe. Do I truly believe them simply because they come from the Scriptures? But not only do we, need, uh, do we need to be willing in this critical thinking, we need to not be arrogant, but we need to be honest thinkers. We need to be honest thinkers. Do you see what he said here in this passage? He said, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. And, and then he says in verse 20, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Who are you talking about, God says? Who are these people that you put up? You see, we all need to learn to be honest with our thinking, and with our thought processes. We need to become aware of our own limitations and to realize, you know what? Compared to the wisdom of God, I do not know all that I think I know. But to bring this point home before we move on, I would encourage each of us as Christians, as Christians, we must be willing to examine our own beliefs. But then I would challenge the watching world I would, watch the, I would challenge those who do not claim to be Christians, the skeptics out there. Are you applying, you, you may be a critic of Christianity, but are you applying that same level of criticism to your own world value, views, your own world views, to your own beliefs? I had a conversation not that long ago with someone who had once claimed to follow Christianity and then they walked away from the faith. And I had a conversation with this person, and they began to be critical of some of the views that they had just been taught. This is why it's important for, for Christian parents to teach critical thinking to their children. Because if our children just spit back whatever we've taught them... Now, most, much of this happens as they become teenagers, where we have to train them to establish their own belief systems. Because as they're children, they'll just parrot back whatever we tell them, for the most part. But then we need to help them learn to think these things through on their own. But what happened with this individual was he never fully adopted those views personally. He just had parroted his, the system that he grew up with. And then he began to challenge those views later in life. But as I talked with them, I, him, I discovered that he had adopted a new sound... Of, uh, sorry, I'm having trouble getting these words out. A new found set of values he had adopted. They weren't Christian values. And it, I realized this, the level of criticism that he was willing to examine his Christian upbringing with, this person was not applying the same level of criticism to the new beliefs that they had adopted, but just accepted them. I would encourage anyone who's at a point of struggle, anyone who's at a moment of doubt, and you may be thinking, like, how... How do I accept these teachings of Christ? How do I accept the Bible? And if you're being pulled in another direction, I would encourage you, whatever level of skepticism that you're willing to apply to the Word of God, please be intellectually honest and apply that same level of skepticism to the prevailing views of the world that we live in today. There are many points in history when, when the world would have been a better place if people rejected the prevailing wisdom of the day. Slavery was the prevailing wisdom of the day for centuries. It's what everyone accepted. In fact, there's, there's an interesting saying that goes on, that goes around now. There's a lot of social issues in our culture today, aren't there, that are being debated back and forth. A lot of people redefining a lot of things in the world today. And there's a statement that people are saying, well, be careful. You don't want to find yourself on the wrong side of of history. How many of you have heard somebody say that before? You'll be on the wrong, you believe that? You're going to be on the wrong side of history. Well, this passage reminds us that there's a more important side that we need to find ourselves on. What if your views are on the right side of your history, but they're on the wrong side of God Almighty? 
What if? Non-believing, non-believing world, are you willing to ask the honest question, what if God's word is true and the views you've adopted are completely wrong? The Lord here says in this passage through the Apostle Paul that God will make foolish the wisdom of this world. We need to be critical thinkers, challenge our personal viewpoints and allow the Holy Spirit and the scriptures to inform our thinking. So first of all, think critically. Secondly, this morning, we need to think faithfully. Think faithfully. Look at verse 21. Let's read on this next section here. Verse number 21. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. You see what it is? Some people might say, see that? This is foolishness. You just blindly accept things by faith. Well, we're going to talk about accepting things by faith, but not a blind faith acceptance, but a reasonable faith acceptance. But yet there's this foolish message of a, of a person standing up and talking about Jesus, a man who died and was buried, and the, 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 this message that he rose from the, the dead. He said, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Verse 22, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks. Say it with me. Christ. What? The power of God and the wisdom of God. You've heard people say, if you're a believer and you've talked with non-believers, you've heard people say, Well, you Christians live by faith, but I live my life by fill in the blank, science, or by reason. You live by faith, but I live by science or by reason. But the truth is this. Every person lives by both faith and reason. There are no There are no unfaithful people in the world. There is no such thing as people of faith and people not of faith. All people, all thinking of any kind, Christian or non, all thinking begins with, I'm going to give you a word now or two words, a phrase, all thinking begins with a faith assumption. It all begins with a faith assumption, or you could put it this way, a set of presuppositions. Do you know what a presupposition is? Some of you probably do. You've heard that term before. I'm saying a faith assumption or a set of presuppositions. A presupposition is something that we just suppose to be true before we begin our conversation. For instance, I'll give you something really basic. We all presuppose or we all assume together that tomorrow the sun will rise. We just assume that. Can't scientifically prove necessarily it's going to happen. I can look at the evidence. I can say, well, it would be extremely unlikely, improbable to infinity that the sun would not rise tomorrow. We just, we don't, we don't start our conversation because you say, well, yeah, that's obvious. That's my point. That's why it's a presupposition because it's obvious. It's the obvious starting point that we all suppose to be true. So as we make our plans to say, hey, you want to go out to, you want to go out to lunch tomorrow? Well, that depends on if the sun rises tomorrow. Because if it doesn't, then we've got to make another plan altogether. That's absurd. That would be an absurdity. Because we come from the same set of presuppositions. We say the sun will rise. Now, when we come to matters of the greatest significance in all of life, I'm afraid people are coming with different sets of presuppositions. For instance... Some will come with the presupposition, there is no God. That's their presupposition. But others will come with the presupposition that says, there is a God. Which of those statements is the statement of scientific reliability? Which statement? Well, if we're looking at the scientific method as we understand it, neither Neither of those statements is a scientific statement. However, I'd ask you this question. What is the more rational statement? There is no God or there is God. 
Well, I would argue this morning that the more rational statement would be that there is a God, that there is a creator. In fact, many will point historically to the fact that it was the church, particularly the Roman church, that squelched many um, scientific movements that happened. And that is true. There were times when the church as a corporate entity was not very friendly towards science. But if you truly study history, you find it was the it was the Renaissance, it was the Reformation that opened people's understanding to the Word of God and a greater emphasis on thinking, that people started to think, wait a minute, if we have a presupposition that there is an orderly creator and that there is an ordered universe and that it's not chaos, but there's order behind all this, then it only makes reasonable sense that we should be able to scientifically uncover some of the truth and ration, rationality and order behind the universe. You see, the presupposition that there is an orderly creator and a design, an intelligent design, actually fuels scientific discovery to say, let's uncover the order behind the universe. However, I would challenge anyone that comes with the presupposition that the universe began out of chaos. If the universe began out of chaos and disorder, then why would we ever expect to find order in the world? Why would we ever have a reliable scientific method? How could you trust or depend on science? You can't. We're not talking about faith versus science. We're talking about a, a rational faith. A faith-filled rationalism that starts from a sound place. Listen, do not act on bad information. Do not build your life. Do not build your eternal hopes on bad information. Remember, think critically what if the prevailing view of the day is wrong and God's word is true? You see, all thinking begins with a faith presupposition, a faith assumption. It's just which assumption will you begin with? Where will you put your faith? In this passage, it says in the beginning of verse number 21, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. That's, an, that's a statement of irony right there. Who has given all wisdom and knowledge and thinking and understanding to mankind? God has. And what has man done with that wisdom? Become willfully blind. Become willfully blind to the truth of God's word. I'm reminded of this. This is probably my favorite passage of faith and reason. It's Hebrews 11 and verse number 3. Hebrews 11 in verse number three, the Bible says, through faith, we understand. I love those, that's, that statement right there. Through faith, we understand. Through faith, we think. Through faith, we study. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. That is the faith assumption of every believer that God has revealed himself and has revealed his universe to us through his word. And that faith does not, does not uh, cause us to walk away from reason, but faith is the door to greater reason, to greater rationality, to greater understanding. But I'm afraid that is not the, the predominant kind of teaching we're getting in, in Christ, Christianity today. There's so much preaching about our feelings and not a lot of preaching and teaching about our thinking processes. We need to raise our children and raise a generation that is willing to think critically, to think biblically, to think faithfully. And he says some things here about, he says that preaching opens the eyes and opens the understanding. And now we're going to shift in verses 23 and 24, heading into our most, uh, our final and concluding point. But let's just see the, how the passage builds. He says in verse 22 that uh, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. By the way, I'm going to move quickly through this point. These are two unreliable sources of wisdom. Miracles and philosophy. They can help. They serve a purpose. God has used miracles. God can even use philosophers. But these are two, these are two unreliable sources of truth. The only reliable source of truth begins at the starting point of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now stay with me now. I know we've been, this has been kind of heavy here, but we're going to bring this to an important conclusion. Look at what he's, he starts to talk about the cross of Jesus now. 
How does the gospel, how does salvation, how does the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus truly affect all of this? Well, look what he says in verse number 23. So you've got the, the Jews wanting a sign, the Greeks wanting wisdom. But in verse number 23, forget the sign, forget the wisdom. Verse 23, but we preach Christ. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the revelation of God in human form. You see, the world changed forever, and our understanding of the world changed forever when Jesus showed up, when Jesus came. By the way, that is why we still split history right down the middle at the birth of Jesus Christ. Over here, we've got the beginning of history, and for generations, we've, re we've referred to all these years as what years? The B.C. years. And then over here, for all these years after the birth of Christ, we've split history. And now we've called this A.D. Or, or in the year of our Lord. But that's not woke anymore. You can't say A. You can't say A.D. and B.C. Not allowed. How many of you knew that? No, you can't do that. You've been out of the classroom for a little while, so it's no more. It's no more B.C. Well, it's still B.C. But it doesn't mean before Christ. It means what? Some of you know. Before the, yeah, before the common era, okay? And now you come out, some of you are like, I've just taught, this is, this is the way it is now, okay? And now over here, it's not A.D., <laughs> it is C.E., it's the common era. Now, if you're shocked by this revelation, just, you know, just let it in. This is what's going on, because this is my point. It doesn't matter if you call it B.C. or A.D. or B.C. or C.E. When you come right down to the dividing line of that point in history, you're talking about before and after the life of Jesus Christ. Like it or not, Jesus still is the dividing line of history. And the world was, why? Why? Because the world was forever changed by the fact that God became a man. The universe makes sense when, when God says this world is so broken... This world is, is so sinful that they must be redeemed. They must be rescued. And so I will give myself, the, the, the Son of God, equal with the Father, the Son of God steps down from the throne of eternity. He's born in a manger. He takes on human flesh. He becomes a man. He lives a perfect life. He dies on a cross. He sheds his blood. He gives his life as the sacrificial payment for all of mankind's sins. And then he rises from the dead. Hallelujah. He comes back to life to prove that he is the, the eternal son of God, the eternal king. And there is coming a day where he will restore all things and he will make this world right. And that is the message that changes the way I think about everything. That is the message that changes. That truth changes my view of everything. The gospel is the starting point of truth. You see, I think critically, I think faithfully, but it's the gospel that helps me think spiritually. It helps me think spiritually. Why? Because in verse number 25, let's look at verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. In other words, if you could take all of the strength of all of mankind... All of, the, all of the intellectual might and wisdom and scientific knowledge, if you could accumulate it all together, if you were to compare it to the wisdom of God, it would look like absurdity. It's not that the world has no wisdom. It's that it doesn't compare to the wisdom of God and the plan of God. Think spiritually. Where does spiritual thinking come from? come from? It's when the believer is overpowered by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 26. Ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Now, this is kind of funny, actually. There's a little bit of humor. If, you weren't, if you're not paying attention, you got to imagine you're in Corinth and you're reading this letter for the first time. And he's talking to you as a group of people, a literal group of people in Corinth. And he says, for you see your calling, brethren, I mean, look at your church. There's not many wise men there. Not many mighty. You're kind of looking around. Yeah, yeah. What he's saying is in the church, he's saying, look, you are not some, look at yourselves. You're not some great, impressive group of people with all kinds of degrees and education and all of that. You're pretty weak people. 
Now, some people would say, see that? We don't need to be educated, and we don't, we don't need to, that, that education stuff for the world. We've just got the Bible, and, and we're going to stick to it. You're missing the point. You're missing the point. The point is this. There's no reason, this church, this group of people, there's no reason for them to be wise. But they are wise. It's just like you could study this back in the early chapters of the book of Acts. When the apostles began preaching, the Jewish leaders were like, where did you learn all this stuff? They said, you are, you can look it up. He said, you are unlearned and ignorant men. You're fishermen. Where did you learn? It wasn't that they weren't intelligent and they mocked them for their lack of intelligence. It was that they said, how did you learn all of this? Where did this come from? You didn't get schooling for this. Why? Because the gospel of Jesus Christ gives me an understanding of the world and an, an access to knowledge that I've never had before. It opens my eyes to truth. And I study, some of you remember, especially those of you that got saved later in life. For me, I, got, I came to know Jesus as a, as a young child, and so I always was surrounded by the scriptures. So I always knew the thrust of what they were saying. But some of you became believers later. You started reading the Bible, and you're like, this stuff's been in here the whole time? Like, how did I not know this before? How did I not know these answers? I mean, my family life, my finances, like, there's all of this stuff in here. Where, where have you been my whole life? It's, what he's saying is, listen, God gives wisdom, not just, now, we should seek after as much education as we can receive. But true wisdom isn't found in a textbook, and it's not found in a philosophy class, although those things can help you, and the Lord can use those things. But true wisdom comes from a deep and growing relationship with Jesus Christ. The believers here were overcome by the gospel. Overpowered by, and by the way, they were humbled by the gospel. There's a lot of Christians who, for some reason, they get, they're humble before God and they get saved. And then they begin to learn the scriptures and they become the most arrogant, pompous people in the world. As if we know so much better than everyone out there. No, if anything, the gospel should humble us to say, I wouldn't know how to live without Jesus. I wouldn't know how to live without, without the, the, the message of the Bible. See, the believer is humbled by the gospel. And I'm not sure what verse I left, left off on. I'll look at uh, verse 29. Or we'll read verse 28. So he's taken weak things now up to verse number 28. And God uses base things of the world. And things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Why? Verse 29. That no flesh should glory in his presence. It's not about me, it's about him. It's not about what I know, it's about what he's revealed. Verse 30, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That according as it is written, would you read this last statement with me? As it is written, what? He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. You see, as my thinking is renewed, I begin to glory only in what I've received of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to say this as we conclude this morning. Only the cross of Jesus can change your thinking. If you're a believer, if you've already trusted Christ as your Savior... You need to get back to the gospel message of the cross each and every day because the message of what Jesus did on the cross and his resurrection power, that message will change the way that you think each and every day. Think, who am I? And what has Christ done for me? How then should I live? How should I think? But for anyone in this room, young or old, for any watching now or who will watch this video, if you've never come to Christ, if you've never come to God through Jesus Christ, only the cross of Jesus can change your thinking. You see, the Bible calls that repentance. It's called repentance. It's when I hear the message that God loved me so much that he sent Jesus to die for my sins. And rise from the dead so that if I believe in him, I'll have everlasting life. That produces a change in my mind. 
it makes me realize a couple things about myself. It makes me realize I am not as good a person as I thought I was. In fact, I'm a sinner and God is holy. That's a change in my, that's a change in my thinking process. To become a Christian, you have to change your thought process. God has to show you you're not basically a good person. You're basically a sinful person. But God loves you anyway. Jesus died for you because of that. For the very reason of your sin, Jesus died for you. You have to change your thinking about who God is. He's not just the man upstairs who's okay with how I live. He is the sovereign and perfect Lord. And I'll have to give account to him. See, when I'm confronted with the gospel, it changes who I think about myself. What I think about myself. It changes what I think about God. And then it changes how I think I can come to God. I can't come to God on my own. I can't come to God by my religion. I can only come to God through what he did for me by grace. And that change of thinking, that repentance, it's called, on the one side, it's repentance, which brings about faith in your heart. That doesn't have to be a long process. That can happen in a moment, in a miraculous moment. In fact, the most famous Christian hymn of all time Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. In a moment, there was a man who had evil thoughts. His name was John Newton who wrote that song. He had evil thoughts. He was a slave trader. He hated God. He hated Christians. He, he hated everything. But God brought him to a moment in his life that changed his thinking forever. He saw Jesus for who he was. And then he wrote that song. I once was blind, but now I see. I see. And if you're here today, if you're watching today, and right now, the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart. And you're like, maybe it's scary. Maybe you're saying, wait a minute. I've thought this way my whole life. I've thought one way about the Bible. I've thought one way about Jesus my whole life. And now I'm starting to see it differently. That's the miracle of grace. That's the Holy Spirit doing his work of repentance. He's changing your mind. Now, all you have to do is say yes to Jesus. All you have to do is say, yes, I believe, Jesus, that you died for me. I believe you're the only answer, and I put my trust in you. Please save me. And that begins a process of renewed thinking that we enjoy the rest of our lives as the saved children of God. So as we conclude, would you please bow your heads and close your eyes? We'll sing a song to end in just a minute, but with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I've got to ask this question. Has there been a time in your life where your thinking changed about Jesus? Has there been a time in your life where you have confessed your sin to God and asked Jesus to be your Savior? If there's never been that moment, would you make that moment right now? Wherever you are, why don't you bow your head and pray to the Lord? What do I pray? It's something very simple from your heart. There's no magic prayer, but from your heart, say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. And now, for the first time, I understand that you died and rose again. Not just for the whole world, but for me. And right now, I ask you to save me. Please save me. Wherever you are, the Bible says if you'll pray from a sincere heart and call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. It's a promise. And if you'll simply cry out to Jesus Christ, he'll save you and he'll change your life. Do it right now. If you have more questions, please let us know. Ask me after the service or send a message. How can I know for sure that I am saved, that I've trusted Christ as my Savior? Now, Christians... Maybe you needed your thinking to be challenged today. Maybe you've gotten lazy in your thought processes. Maybe you need to get back to the Word of God and, and, and ask Him. What area of your life needs to be changed this morning? As the guitar plays, let's just have a quiet moment of prayer. Lord, we're so thankful for the revelation that you've given us in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that you'd make us a courageous people. And 
Lord, many people in this world, we know, they scoff at our beliefs. They scoff at the Bible. But we're thankful that you've given us something sure and steadfast that we can stand on. I pray for those who may be struggling with coming to trust you as their Savior. I pray that they'd make that decision to let go of their pride, to let go of their own way of thinking, and to surrender to you and be saved. Please bless this hymn that we sing now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet as we conclude. And come behold the wondrous mystery. Behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. Be the theme of heaven's praises, hold in frail humanity. In our longing, in our time. I pray that you'll give us a great rest of our Sunday, Lord. Uh, keep us safe as we go our separate ways. Bring us back here Wednesday night and then safely again on Sunday. We ask this in your name. Amen. Thank you, Artist Mist.